Well, greetings, everyone, to God's Unchanging Word in this week's edition for news, nuggets, and insights. Today is Friday, May 26, 2017, one week away from Pentecost. Today we have a lot to cover, and today we're going to focus several events, especially this weekend, which is Memorial Day weekend, is where America pays tribute to the fallen who have given their lives in service of our nation. We're also going to be talking about the events with Donald Trump in his Middle East uh, tour going on right now, and in our news nuggets and insights for the biblical portion of our program, we're going to continue with the journey of the Israelites, and this week the Israelites reach Mount Sinai, where God gives them the Ten Commandments. Over 40 million people are expected to be on the highways this weekend as they gather together with families as the nation pays tribute to its fallen, honoring the dead on the day that we set aside, May 29th, 2017, this year for Memorial Day. A lot of people don't know the actual roots because today as we get into this holiday, it's become more of a, a celebration for picnics. The Indianapolis race that's going, I think it's the 102nd year for that race this year. So what I thought we would do today as we honor the fallen, we would go back and tell you a little brief history of Memorial Day. And we have from the History Channel a brief video. So let me ask you this. Do you know what was the original name for Memorial Day? When we come back after this short video, we'll tell you exactly what that name is. It's the three-day weekend that officially kicks off the summer season. A time for hanging at the beach, barbecuing, even catching a few laps of the Indy 500. But Memorial Day is also the most solemn American holiday, a day to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice while defending their nation. The Civil War, America's bloodiest chapter, over 600,000 soldiers killed in action. Almost every community in every state suffered the loss of young men. As the war came to an end, mourners in both northern and southern states began placing flags and flowers on the graves of fallen soldiers. The town of Waterloo, New York is officially credited with starting the holiday. On May 5, 1866, its citizens closed their shops and businesses so that everyone could decorate the graves of the men killed during the war. Then an old war general had an idea. John A. Logan was the leader of a Union Veteran Association. He spearheaded an effort to unite all the decoration services into one national holiday, designating May 30th as Decoration Day. On the first National Decoration Day, 1868, 5,000 war widows, orphans, and other mourners gathered at Arlington National Cemetery. They placed flowers and ribbons on the 20,000 graves of both Union and Confederate soldiers. Two future presidents and fellow Union veterans, Ulysses Grant and James A. Garfield, attended the ceremony. Throughout the 19th century, Decoration Day grew. Ceremonies were held in major Civil War battlefields like Gettysburg, Pennsylvania and Antietam Field in Maryland. By the end of the century, the holiday was renamed Memorial Day. But war wounds ran deep. Most southern states refused to commemorate a holiday they regarded as honoring Union soldiers. So each state commemorated their war dead with different Confederate decoration days. Several southern states continue the tradition to this day. World War I ushered in the age of modern warfare. America lost over 130,000 soldiers in the global conflict. This shared experience finally bonded America's north and south. When the war ended, May 30th became a day to honor all American soldiers who died in battle as far back as the Revolutionary War. America interred its first unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery on Armistice Day, 1921. Every Memorial Day, this soldier and other unknown soldiers are honored with a wreath-laying ceremony conducted by the President or Vice President. They are reminders of all those who never made it home. Memorial Day became a federal holiday in 1971, and Congress shifted it from May 30th to the fourth Monday in May, giving federal workers a three-day weekend. 
All across America, veterans and civilians still gather in parades and vigils to remember the generations who gave their lives for their nation's freedom. Well, did you catch it in the video? They told you exactly what the name of the holiday was before it became Memorial Day. It was originally named Decoration Day, and the nation had set aside that particular day so that people could take it from their work, from school, and from normal activities to go out and pay honor to all those who had fallen during the Civil War. It was called Decoration Day, and the very first Decoration Day, there were over 20,000 graves that were decorated to pay honor to the fallen. I want to talk now about a nugget of those fallen, and this is in Vietnam. A lot of tribute is paid to World War I and especially World War II veterans, but Vietnam was a very ugly battle, and it literally brought chaos and havoc throughout our nation. Did you know that there were 58,220 fatal casualties that the Americans lost during that conflict? There were an additional 304,000 wounded in that war, and another 75,000 were permanently disabled. Many of those veterans still carry those wounds physically and psychologically today. Today, there's approximately Every day that goes by, there are approximately 20 veterans from Vietnam all the way through to the Gulf South War and into the Middle East conflicts today that approximately 20 veterans a day commit suicide. So it's a horrible thing that the United States has gone through. In Vietnam, there's a memorial that's built in Washington, D.C. They call it the Vietnam Memorial. And if you look behind me here, you see on this wall, on this wall is every person who died in that conflict in, uh, in Vietnam. And what's interesting is this, is that in each one of these panels is a day-to-day -day account of the fallen. And if you were to look at this wall, you would see that it began with a small amount of, of casualties each day till you see it's, it, at its zenith of how many people were dying in the Vietnam War. When the veterans came back from this, they were not welcomed. They were spit upon, they were despised, they were made fun of, they were mocked. Across the nation on campuses, there were protests, and, and basically they felt demoralized that the nation had turned their back on them. And the nation needed something to heal from this horrible conflict that lasted for so many years. They created what was called the Traveling Wall. The Traveling Wall was established in 1984, which was a miniature version of what you've seen in Washington, D.C. It was a traveling wall, approximately three-fifths the size of the memorial in Washington, and it was created to travel across the, U the United States to help heal the nation. The reason I'm bringing this nugget out today is that I, I actually saw this wall one day. I'm going to tell you that story of what it was like, and I want to draw a connection to God's fallen before we get past this segment in our program today. It was on a Sabbath afternoon, and Audrey and I had gone up to, uh, I believe it was either Tulane University or Loyola University, where they had, where they had brought this wall, and I was not expecting what I saw. And to this day, I am still moved from this traveling wall. They had a, a trailer that goes along with it, and, and inside this trailer, there's memorabilia, there's artifacts from the Vietnam War. But more importantly, they take the wall itself, and they bring smaller panels so that the people in certain areas who can't travel to Washington, D.C., can go and take a look at these names that's written upon this wall. Somewhere in this concept, there's an artist that created a picture that you've probably seen to this day. Let me tell you about what's going on behind this picture. If, in this artist's rendition, you see all the soldiers, all these names that are written, all right? So in this picture, you see the soldiers themselves. Let's bring that back up on full screen again. You see the soldiers looking back at the person who's on the outside of the wall looking in. 
All right, so the artist created this when he saw what was going on in Washington, D.C., when people would approach this wall. And so I saw this take place here in New Orleans. And there was so much conflict and so much pain in many of the families and loved ones, mothers, fathers, wives, their children, they never got to see the fallen. Many of the soldiers never came back. They were buried in Vietnam or they were lost and never found. And so what people would do is, as I sat back on this bench, which brought tears to my eyes, you would see people walk up I get emotional even thinking about it to this day. This was in 1984 when this, when this took place. The family member would walk up to that wall. They would go panel by panel looking for the date where their son had died in Vietnam. They would take that panel and they would go down that wall line by line till they found their son. They would place the hand on that wall where their son was and made that connection to be able to, to pay homage and to, to have that connection back to their son. And that's what you're seeing here on that wall. That artist captured the process of what the people were going through to help heal this nation. I thought about that as I sat back in the years as I contemplated over this, and there was something that seemed very biblical about this, is that it's talking about God's fallen. In Hebrews 4, look what, look what the Bible tells us about Hebrews 4. It says that we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with our infirmities. So day by day as we go through year by year, decade by decade, through the centuries. What God has done is he has memorialized his people. And day by day, as we go through the conflicts that we face as Christians, just like when Jesus Christ went into Jerusalem and he wept and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and what he wanted to do for his people and how they rejected him, is that God's telling us is that he has a special place for those who have fallen for him. In Revelation chapter 6, it tells us about all of the souls that had fallen for him. Look what it says now. Let me just read a couple uh, verses here. In the verse, chapter 6 and verse 9, it says this, And when he had opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, O Lord, how long do you not judge and avenge our blood upon them that dwell on the earth? Now, think about this memorial wall now, and look how God looks at those who have fallen for him. Those souls is what we're looking at. He says those souls were actually under the throne. In other words, what God was doing was placing those that he cared the most about under his throne. Those are going to be resurrected when Jesus Christ comes at that first resurrection, at the sound of the trump. And just like we who take Memorial Day so that we don't forget those who died for us, Jesus Christ every year remembers the souls that he will not forget. Memorial Day. All right, so now you can go ahead and play the video, Jeff. This is a few moments ago, I placed a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. And as I stepped back and stood during the moment of silence that followed, I said a small prayer, and it occurred to me that each of my predecessors has had a similar moment, and I wondered if our prayers weren't very much the same, if not identical. We celebrate Veterans Day on the anniversary of the armistice that ended World War I, the armistice that began on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And I wonder, in fact, if all Americans' prayers aren't the same as those I mentioned a moment ago. 
for all we can ever do for our heroes is remember them and remember what they did and memories are transmitted through words. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, grave and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. And all we can do is remember. There's always someone who is remembering for us. No matter what time of year it is or what time of day, there are always people who come to this cemetery, leave a flag or a flower or a little rock on a headstone. And they stop and bow their heads and communicate what they wished to communicate. I think sometimes of General Matthew Ridgway, who the night before D-Day tossed sleepless on his cot and talked to the Lord and listened for the promise that God made to Joshua. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. We are surrounded today by the dead of our wars. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them and what they did and why they had to be brave for us. All we can do is try to see that other young men never have to join them. Today as never before, we must pledge to remember the things that will continue the peace. Today as never before, we must pray for God's help in broadening and deepening the peace we enjoy. Let us pray for freedom and justice and a more stable world. And let us make a compact today with the dead. A promise in the words for which General Ridgway listened, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. As with Joshua and General Ridgway, we say today, Jesus Christ is on his throne. He will not forsake us. In the news this week, President Trump, in his first trip overseas, has a major undertaking. First, he's meeting with three major faiths in the world, and he's on a nine-day, five-country tour. First stop was in Saudi Arabia. Second stop is in Israel. And the third stop, as we actually are taping today, he is heading to Rome. He is talking to each of the three major faiths in the world. You have the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians. In his first stop with the Saudi Arabians, he began a theme that he's carrying throughout his tour. It's talking about driving out terrorism. It's, and the irony of this is just one day before, he makes all these statements where they have over 55 leaders in the Muslim world come together, where he talks about driving out terrorism. The very next day, in, in England, there's another bombing and a terrorist attack at a music concert that's attended by mostly young girls between the ages of 8 and 16. As of the taping of this program, 22 people have died and another 55 people have been injured or in the hospital. This has got to come to a stop. For the first time in, in modern history, we have a president now who's out proclaiming and pulling all this together and telling all the Muslim nations this has got to come to a stop and you need to be a part of this and you need to get your religious leaders and your clerics on board to call it for what it is. Where this will go, I don't know, but it's a major undertaking. We need to pray that he will have some success in this tour for where he's going. For the first time, a president went directly from Saudi Arabia to Israel. 
where he's again welcomed with open arms by the Israeli government, just like he was in Saudi Arabia. It is, it is unprecedented the welcome he's being received in in uh, in in this time that we're going through, and it's absolutely uh, amazing of what we're looking at. One of his first stops was to the Wailing Wall, the ancient Wailing Wall, and this is the first sitting president of the United States who literally went to this wall, walked over, and just like so many Israelis, he had a prayer, he folded it up, and he put it in the wall. In the past, presidents would not do this for fear of inflaming the Muslim nations around Israel. From that, instead of being fearful, he met with the Palestinians. He went right from there, and he met with President Abbas in hoping of restoring the peace talks between the Palestinians and Israel. While this communication was going on, and while the speech was being broadcast, members of the Palestinian cabinet we're already broadcasting that this will never work as long as Israel is in the land. So where this is going to go is almost like it's dead from the start because Israel will not give up the lands they have and Palestine will continue to wipe and destroy Israel off the face of the earth until they're no longer in the region. So again, our prayers need to go out that this can take place. But when we look at scripture and we look at prophecy, we're going to see that there's not going to be peace. There will be an accord signed at some point in time. And we know when that accord for peace is signed, that we're getting very close to the return of Jesus Christ. As in, in we understand from the prophecies from the Old Testament. As we're taping this program, Donald Trump is on the plane and he's heading to Rome to meet with Pope Francis. So hopefully by next week we'll be able to bring more information on what's going on. Now, did you know, before we go to the next video, let me ask you another question. Did you know that the Bible sets aside a chapter to honor the fallen elect? Did you know that? Now, we talked about that with uh, the Vietnam War and how God talks about those souls who's under the throne. And did you know where it is? When we come back from this next video, and I know we're playing a few extra videos this week, but we're doing this in honor of Memorial Day. So sit back, think about it, and when we come back, we'll tell you exactly where this chapter is that God uses to memorialize those that have fallen in the past. Take a look, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back. Well, do you know where it's at? It's found in Hebrews 11. It says, all these died in faith, never having received the promise. God takes very dearly to those that love him and that he knows that have been persecuted and things that they've gone through over the years. God will never forget those. There's a reward, he says, that's laid up for heaven. And he's going to bring that when he comes back. As I was watching that video with you just a moment ago, I had to wonder if God had a memorial day in the kingdom of God in a thousand years. I wonder if that day will fall on the day of trumpets and the return of Jesus Christ when that battle takes place and everything is over and Jesus Christ is restored as King of Kings and Lord of Lords on this earth. It's interesting. We'll have to see what goes on. Our Memorial Day is important to us as a nation, and we need to make sure that we tell our children. People today seem to have no respect for the nation. They want to burn our flags. They have little respect of the freedom that those have fought and died for us. In fact, they're mocked. So I hope that this weekend you'll take some time to share this with your family. Spend some time talking about this great nation of what God has given to you and I. Okay, Biblical Nuggets, our journey with the children of Israel in the wilderness continues. This is week six of the Feast of Weeks of the seven weeks as we march toward Pentecost. The children's journey today takes us to Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2 is where we begin. It is at this point in time that God gives us another anchor for the reestablishment of time and the duality at Mount Sinai and Pentecost. Here's what it says. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites had left Egypt, that on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. And after they set out from Repidim, and they entered into the desert of Sinai, Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Now, whether we realize it or not, one of the nuggets that God has hidden right here is he has literally locked in the time of bringing us to the time of the receiving of the Ten Commandments. So now, what I'm going to do today now, we want to go through and we want to do part two in reestablishment of time. And if you're doing the weekly series with the Exodus, using it as a Bible study, you will find that you are actually at this chapter in that study. We call it the reestablishment of time, part two. So now let's do a quick uh, reminder from last week of what we had. It's now on this on this calendar now. We began talking about in ex, in uh, in the Exodus where they, God spoke to them in the, um, the murmuring of the children of Israel and how that afternoon God gave them quail and in the morning he gave them uh, the little hoary wafers which came to be known as manna. For they said, what is it? And that's what the manna was. And they would gather, remember, six days and on the sixth day they gathered twice as much and the following day was the Sabbath. And it was on this time that God used it to establish his calendar and the Sabbath day. So now we're going back let me reach, let's do this again. You see it counting back ways, all the way back into the first month. All right, so here we are at the, at the first day of the second month. We pick up into the first month, the 30th day. God's calendar has 30 days in the first two months. And we work our way backwards now to establish the calendar. 20, 19, 17, all the way back through the 15th and the 14th day where we stopped just now, which is the Passover. And as we saw, and if you haven't studied go back and study it, this conclusively proves that on this year, the very first Passover, in the duality of time, that Christ was going to be crucified, as Daniel says, in the midst of the weeks. And so here we have the 14th shawl falling on the midst of the week. The first Passover for the Israelites fell on a Wednesday, just like at the time of Jesus Christ. It said at that exact time, it was during the time of Christ's crucifixion. So now with this understanding, we can show the events of the Old Testament parallel the events of the New Testament and the time of Christ. All right, now moving backwards now, let's finish out our calendar, bringing us all the way back to the very first day. 
Now, this is why people don't understand this specific day. Now, if you see what I have over here, Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2, and where it says that, that on the first month, the first day of the month, there's an assumption that people made. The assumption was that it had to be the first day of the week. But the calendar of God had began thousands of years earlier. And this is simply a continuation of the calendar from a thousand years earlier. And so what we're given here is the first day of this month in the continuation of God's calendar actually fell on a Thursday. And if you count the days exactly, you will find that the parallel time for the old and new is exactly the same to the minute. The other thing I want to bring to your attention in your study is the setting aside of the lamb. When Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem, and, and the world talks about the Palm Sunday, well, according to Scripture, it's not a Palm Sunday. It's a Sabbath day that he's actually coming in. And we see here that that time in the Old Testament on the 10th day when they set the lamb aside was also a Sabbath day. So here we have a mirror overlapping and you can put them side by side. And the Old Testament and the New Testament parallels exactly the time of Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, his setting aside and the calendar of months. All right, so now, I brought up now the first two calendars, which we just went through already, and we went through that last week, so I didn't spend a lot of time today. What I want to do today is show you now why it's important in Exodus 19, verses 1 and 2, of where we're at. So now let's begin our calendar. We know we're going to come to Mount Sinai on the 50th day because that's the parallel of the giving of the commandments and Pentecost in the New Testament. And Pentecost in Greek simply means 50th. So if we count it from the time of the, of the wave sheath, all right, which would be on the morrow after the Sabbath, inclusive of the two holy days within that seven weeks, seven days of unleavened bread, you would find that that 50th day comes to that on the seventh and this month, a uh, third month. So now, let's go through and let's count our time out and see if we can come to that. Now, I go into detail in this study. So if you haven't been through it yet, go back into this study. It's the Establishing a Time, Part 2, and go through it in detail this week in, in your study. All right, so now, let's go through and let's begin to see what God has for us. God instructs Moses to bring Israel back to worship on the mount. Remember, that was the very beginning that we started the program with. Exodus 3 and verse 12 says this, When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt and shall serve God upon this mountain. Remember, it's an amazing story how God drives Moses out of Egypt where he was like heir to the throne. He goes to, to, uh, to Jethro and here he is at the mountain of God. So he was at the mountain of God, and, and God calls for him at that point and says, go get those people in Israel uh, in Egypt and bring them back to this mountain. So now Moses is bringing them back, and now he's at the mountain where God told him to bring the children to. Now, now let's go into the counting of this time. He says, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath that you brought forth the sheave of the wave offering. The seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Remember now, the counting for Pentecost isn't a counting back ways anywhere. It's always counting seven Sabbaths. When do you begin? It begins with the morrow after the Sabbath. In other words, the Sunday or the first day of the week after the Sabbath inside the seven days of unleavened bread. Why that? Because the seven days pictures the 7,000 year plan of God. So the wave sheath, which is Jesus Christ, which people understand, has to fall within the 7,000 year plan of God. Therefore, the day has to fall within the seven days of unleavened bread because the two parallel one another. So now we have here, that would be, all right, the first Sabbath. Remember, it says you shall count seven Sabbaths after you bring the wave sheath. So here's the, here's the first Sabbath, okay? All right, here we go, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and we brings us to the seventh Sabbath, which is in the third month. That why, that's why it's important that we understand Exodus 19, verse 1 and 2, because God's time stamping the time that we bring them to the mount to fulfill 
the time frame of the seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, which brings us right here. And it's still counted the same way today. It's never changed. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days. So if you go back and you had this calendar and you began numbering, you can count 50 days from the wave sheath offering. And that brings us to that point. Next week is the seventh week, and next Sunday, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday will be Pentecost, where we have the Feast of First Fruits and the birth of the New Testament church. Exodus chapter 19, Israel is at the foot of the mount. We're going to cover this more next week, but I want to just read just a couple verses out of chapter 19 to show you what God's doing, which is not unlike what he's doing with you and I today with the children of Israel. God first calls them out of bondage and brings them to him, just like with you and I. God calls us out of the condition we in, living in a state of sin, to bring us to him. All right? So at this particular point, I'm going to begin reading now in verse 3. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you're say to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you're to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That term, being carried by eagles' wings, is found also in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. We're going to talk about that next week. So the typology and the wording that God used, how God carried them on eagles' wings, we know they literally walked every step of the way. But God, as if he had carried them, otherwise they'd have never made it to this mount. Verse 5, he says, Now if you will obey me and fully keep my covenant, and then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be, verse 6, is, he says this, verse 6, And you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In these words you to speak to the children of Israel. Verse 6, it says, You will be. What God's telling us before they make the covenant, that if they do this, this is a future promise, that they will be a kingdom of priests. What we're going to go into more next week is a present and a future tense. But if you will look at, at 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it talks about in the current tense is that you are a kingdom of priests. And then in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, it's talking about in past tense, you have been made a kingdom, a nation of kings and priests. So here we have at the beginning when God calls us, he says, if you will do this, this is what I will do. In your converted state saying this is what you are, and in a future tense it's saying you have been. So God talks about all of that and gives us that insight right there at the foot of the mount. We'll talk more about that next week when we come on talking about Pentecost and the children's journey back to God at that mount. So stay tuned for that. We'll be there next week. All righty. Now, uh, the Exodus series, where are we at now? We, we're from point one. We're going to point two now uh, of the crossing of the reestablishment of time. It is DVD 8. If you don't have it, you can go online and you can download it. But take some time again this week. There's just so much information that you're going to find so rewarding and helpful in your studies of understanding the children of Israel and their calling and paralleling that to your calling today in this life. Also, this, this Sabbath, tomorrow, I'll be delivering the sermon that we offered last month, The Sword Stands Ready. This was a, this was a phrase that Mike Pence had used. So now, uh, tomorrow, if you don't have Sabbath service, you have nowhere to go, you could tune in. We'll be broadcasting this sermon live. God willing, it works, that we don't have any complications. But it's called The Sword Stands Ready. And I think you're going to find some really interesting uh, dualities and some times in talking about how God has given you and I a sword 
We'll talk about that tomorrow. So if you don't have services, by all means, tune in. If you don't have your card sent in yet, mail it in, because this sermon is going to be going out very soon, even though we're taping it tomorrow. And so now, the sword stands ready. This week from the website, in the mail, is part three of the Spoils of Egypt. This series actually goes with the original Exodus series and gives you three more points in, those, in that series, bringing us to a total of, of actually 12 parts in that Exodus series. And we're going to do Exodus next uh, the, the next Exodus and Pentecost next week on the day of Pentecost and that's going to be our next offering from the home office. So here you can go online, download it or write in and get your copy of the Exodus Part 3, The Spoils of Egypt and it's called You Can Lead a Horse to Water and we know how that ends up but you can't make them drink. From the vault, we're keeping it up for just two more weeks is our focus of the past from the vault. It is Pentecost or Feast of Weeks. If you hadn't had time to take a look at that sermon, by all means, go online, take a look, and you can just watch that sermon as we draw the connection to the Feast of Weeks versus Pentecost and show that when people talk about Pentecost and they don't bring in Feast of Weeks, they miss all the analogies, the typology, and the depth of understanding that God wants us to learn from the Old Testament Feast of Weeks. All right, next week is Pentecost, next Sunday. So make your plans and be ready for Pentecost. We're also going to be bringing in the news and nuggets something next week that I wanted to bring this week, but there just wasn't enough time in our program to bring it out. But this is something we've been talking about for a long time. Supreme Court Justice Alito warns seminarians that religious liberty is in danger. The wording that he used, the verbiage that he told to these people ought to chill all of us in God's church. It's alarming. Let me show you just one thing, what he said. Supreme Court Justice Alito said during his speech that a wind is picking up that is hostile to those with traditional moral beliefs. Now, Several of the sentences that he delivered to this Catholic seminary is frightening. In the nation that protects freedom of speech, he literally was telling them that their way of life now is in danger. This is a Supreme Court justice named by Bush in 2006 to oversee the Constitution and protect you and I and our beliefs. And he's telling them, just as he did last year to a, a group of judges and, and, a, and a group of uh, ministers, Catholic priests, that the way of life of conservative Christian values is on its way out. And that you and I now are going to be on the fringes. And we've been talking about this danger that's coming. So next week, be sure to look out for News Nuggets and Insights as we go into a lot more about this speech and the dangers that you and I will be facing in the future. So pray about it. Watch. Tell your friends. Next Friday, if you know someone who's interested in News Nuggets and Insights, let them know about it. Go to the website. Sign up for your, for your news alerts. It's absolutely free. And be sure to catch this special edition of News Nuggets and Insights on Pentecost weekend next week. Video of the week. As we close out our program today, this is a little longer than we normally would play a video. But I want to I take you home today with this video. It's called Angel Flight. We came across that a few years ago. And if you went online, you see that many people have made their version of this song. And it, uh, it kind of ties in everything we've been talking about today of remembering those that are fallen. And this is talking about a group of people in America today whose mission is to take the fallen and bring them home again. Just like with Jesus Christ, with you and I, who's given us a mission, and he's bringing us home. And we'll be with him at the return of Jesus Christ. So with that, in a, in, in a difference of the way we normally close, I'm going to tell you goodbye now. And when this program is over with a video, we'll close the program out with a little song. They call it TAPS.
Let's play that video now and let's bring everybody home. Andrews Tower, good morning. Angel Flight Bravo Zero Two, ready for takeoff. Angel Flight Bravo Zero Two, you're number one for takeoff. Runway two five, get them home, boys. I let the C-130 out of Fort Worth town I go up some days I don't want to come down Well, I fly that plane Call the angel flight Come on, brother, you're with me tonight Between heaven and earth you're never alone on the angel flight. Come on, brother, I'm taking you home. I love my family and I love this land. But tonight this flight's for another man. We do what we do cause we heard the call Some gave a little but he gave it all I fly that plane Call the angel flight and Come on brother you're with me tonight on, brother you're with me tonight Between heaven and earth Come on, brother, I'm taking you home. Come on, brother, I'm taking you home. We're starting to have an angel flight, Bravo 02, checking in level 290. We got a hero on board tonight. Roger, radar contact, Godspeed. Well, the carpet's quiet and the stars are bright. Feels kind of like church in here tonight It don't matter where we touch down On the angel flight it's sacred ground When I fly that plane Call the angel flight Got a hero Riding with us tonight Between heaven and earth You're never alone On the angel flight Come on, brother, I'm taking you home Come on, brother, I'm taking you home Come on, brother, I'm taking you home Come on, brother, I'm taking you Come on, brother, I'm taking you home. 